All right, so we're going to start off by downloading the actual lesson files for today. So if you go to weekly learning, scroll down in the list to lesson four, input validation and authentication. Click on that. And just in the middle here, you'll see the lesson four starter files. Go ahead and click that. Don't get nervous about that project piece. We'll talk about that in a little while. When you download it, it's going to download it likely to your downloads directory unless you've changed where things download. But Windows is kind of cool because Windows actually gives you the ability to click on that and then choose to show in the folder. And then that will open the folder where that file actually downloaded to. Now I'm just going to make this nice and easy so that you're not fighting with all the stuff that's in here. The file that we're going to have is called Lesson 4 Current Zip is the name of the file. Shouldn't take long to download, just a couple of seconds. It's only a small uh, file, and it's compressed. Our first step is to extract it, right, to take all the files out of it. So I'm just going to do this in the directory I'm in. I'm going to right-click on it. And I'm going to choose to extract all. Now, if you're using WinRAR, you'll have to do it however you extract, extract your file. The default directory in there right now is in this downloads directory. And that is totally okay. I'm fine with it downloading direct, like extracting directly there. So I'm just going to say extract. And if you keep the check mark that says show extracted files when complete, it makes your life a little easier. So just go ahead and hit extract and it will open up our extracted files for us. And it should create them in the lesson for current directory under your downloads is where all those files should wind up being extracted. So now if we move up a directory, which you can either use this arrow to move up or you can just click right directly here in the interactive um, header. So I'm going to click on downloads so I can see my lesson for current directory. You'll also see the lesson for current zip in there as well. So we might as well just get rid of the zip file, just highlight it, right click on it and choose to delete it. And now we should only have the lesson for current directory. Now, obviously, can I access my files in my web browser if they exist in my downloads directory? So when I open up WAMP, can I get to these files from localhost in my browser? No. Where do they need to live? HTDocs if you're using XAMPP, where if you're using WAMP? Exactly, www. So I need to copy this folder and move it to my www directory, or if you're using XAMPP, htdoc. So click on the folder and either control C, which is what most of you should be using at this point, or right click and choose to copy. Navigate to that directory. So we did create a nice little short link on the left to get there quickly, but just in case you don't have that short link, navigate to this PC, go to your C drive, go to WAMP64, www, comp 1006, and we're going to paste it in here. Control V or right click and paste. Now just ignore the fact that I already have one in there. I'm going to rename this one to Tuesday because it's for my Tuesday class. Yours, I want you to rename just to lesson four. So you're going to call it yours, lesson-04. I have to call mine Tuesday, so they're separated from Monday's class and Wednesday's class. I, mean, I could set up three environments, but that would just make things confusing for you guys. So once you have that directory created, which should be relatively quickly, um, we're going to open it up in our IDE. And there's a few ways we can do that. Um, if you're using Visual Studio Code, when you installed it, you might have the ability to right click on the directory 
and choose to open with code. Now, if it says open with Visual Studio, you don't want that option because it opens up the big Visual Studio Community Edition, which is just a heavyweight thing that's going to consume all your RAM and ruin your life. We want this guy, which is the code editor. If it doesn't say that and it says brackets or atom, that's totally fine too if you're happy with those applications. If not, you have Visual Studio Code, but you don't see that option. What you can do is just open Visual Studio Code, which looks like this. Go to File. It will, it will open up with the last thing you had open, but you can go to File, choose Open Folder, navigate to your WAMP64. Why is this thing so compressed? There we go. WAMP64, www. Comp 1006, Lesson 4 Tuesday, and then hit Select Folder. And that will open up our lesson in the left-hand side here. Oh, we're missing a, we're missing a file. That's interesting. Let me just make sure we're not missing other important files. This is the wrong thing. I have a funny feeling this is literally the lesson I was working on yesterday. Oh yeah, yeah, this has too much data in it. Hold on, or I opened up the wrong file. Let me just double check to make sure that I haven't made a mistake here, because if I did, we're gonna need to download the other one. Nope, this is the wrong directory. <laughs> Give me one second just to fix that. I think I accidentally zipped up the working directory from the other day. Yeah, this is the correct directory. So we're gonna have to go through that process again, I apologize. There we go. In one second, just to replace the file that is currently under the weekly learning. Cool, this is where Georgian's internet dies. Because I mean, if mistakes are gonna happen, they're gonna happen in threes. One second, just to select a different file. All right, let's try that again, just so we don't have any issues. Close your IDE. So if your IDE is open, click the X off to the right-hand side and close it. Navigate to your www directory, comp1006 under WAMP. Click on that lesson four file that you just put underneath there and delete it. That way we don't wind up with any conflicts. We're gonna have to re-download it. You were talking, so you didn't hear anything. <laughs> Wrong files, we need the right files. All right, now let's go get the right files. <laughs> go back to your lesson four, click on the starter files. These are the correct ones this time. They'll say lesson four starter files. Click in here, hit show in folder. Delete the old one because we don't need it. And go through the same process again. Right click. Extract all. That's cool. Hit extract. Opens it up, this is better. Yep, there's the lesson four folder that we need. And I'm pretty sure it's only one level deep. Yeah, that's fine. So just click on the lesson four folder and that's what we're gonna copy. 
right click and choose copy. There we go. The good news is the last time we'll have to do this because going forward, we're just going to use the same folder over and over again. We'll just duplicate it every week inside our IDE. So now navigate to the C drive, WAMP64, www.com1006. Paste that puppy in there. And I'm gonna rename mine, but you can leave yours as lesson four. Okay. Next, open up your IDE. File, open folder, open your lesson four folder and hit select folder. And now we're ready. <clears throat> So as I was going through this over the weekend, I'm trying to like streamline it so it makes it a little easier for you guys to understand. I have noticed that it's, it's a bit of a, it's been a little while since I've taught PHP. It's been about three years since I've taught PHP. And I think I kind of hit it a little harder than what you guys were anticipating it was gonna be like. So I'm gonna slow it down a little bit and make it a little bit simpler. So some of the stuff that's more convoluted, like the fact that our users table had like nine fields in it, I've reduced down, made them a lot more simpler, made it direct, and just kind of streamlined it a little bit so that we can kind of hit it a little faster uh, with a lot less confusion. So because of that, I've created a new SQL file in here that's only gonna create 10 users and it's only gonna create the required fields that we need. So there's no more address fields, there's no more any of that stuff. Not a big deal because when I did the um, index file for this, I've already put the correct data in the index file. So it's not like you have to do that work again, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're going to re-import this table. And the cool thing about it is you'll notice the top line says drop table if exists users. What that will do is it will take the users table that's currently in the database and under the comp 1006 database, it will drop it, which means just like get rid of it. And then it will populate it with this new data. So obviously in order to get that to work, we're going to need to open up WAMP or XAMP, whatever server you're using. Hit yes to open it up. Don't close any of the stuff, just let them open. Hopefully you're getting a nice little green W now, maybe you're still getting orange, that's fine. The only color you don't want is red, right? Those of you with XAMP, when you click start, you should see the three start thing. Right. So the first thing we want to do is go to PHP by admin. And I mean, we can go through the link, but the link always opens up Internet Explorer, which is the world's crappiest browser. I want to do this in Chrome and it's really not that difficult. It's just localhost. Right. Localhost is the root of where we have our stuff. Slash PHP my admin and hit enter. And that will take you to the PHP My Admin page. Another quick way to get there as well is if you go to localhost just by itself and scroll down, you'll notice on the left-hand side, there's actually a link called PHP My Admin. You can always just click that link from that page. That also works. So default pass or default username is root, default password is empty. Um, unless you have a password, then you need to use it, but likely you do not. Just click go. And ta-da, here we are. Now I want to make sure that this SQL that I'm importing only affects my Comp 1006 database. I only have one database. You guys are in the uh, SQL class, so you might have several databases by this point that you've been working on, and they will likely show up here, right? You should, hopefully you will see some of them actually in this list. The one we're working on is the one titled comp underscore 1006. Because I want whatever I do to affect that, I'm going to click on that database, and that activates it, okay? You'll notice that we have a users table in here right now, we're going to replace that with our new users table. So what I would like you to do, just like we did last week, we're gonna to go to import, we're gonna choose a file, we're gonna to navigate to our 
Want 64, WWW Directory, COM 1006, and our lesson four. And you'll see the COM 1006 SQL file in there underneath that lesson four directory. We want that lesson file. Then we're going to click open. Don't worry about checking anything. Literally just scroll down to the bottom and click go. And it will go green. If it does not go green, it is likely your database is not called comp underscore 1006. For whatever reason, you don't have it titled correctly. If that is the case, you will need to go into the SQL file. Actually, the only thing you should have to do is fix users because it likely means your table users is incorrect. That's the only thing I could see being a problem. Otherwise, it should have worked and you should have no problem. Did anybody have a problem importing the file? Cool. Oh, you did have a problem? Are you getting a bunch of red and it's telling you it won't import? Yeah, okay. It's likely that your users table that you have inside your database is not called users, which I mean we can settle in like two seconds. Can you just hand me your laptop and I'll just double check? Thank you. It's just quicker for me to just do it. All right, so you didn't click on the Comp 1006 database. You need to click on that database. Now you can click import. Now we can browse. Go to lesson four. What are you under here? Ramp 64, www, comp 1006, lesson four starter files. So this directory that you have in here, we want to move it up a directory. So when, when I give you this back, copy this, move up a directory and paste it so that it's lesson one, two, three, four, okay? It's in here. I think that's the SQL file. I can't really tell because you don't have extensions turned on. Click go, you're good, no problem. Copy that file out of there and put it into the root with the other one. <clears throat> All right, so once that's done, navigate back to your IDE. We're all finished with PHP My Men. I mean, we're really gonna use that tool very minimally, mostly because I don't wanna confuse you too much because you have a SQL class and this is not a SQL class, right? Uh, quick question though, have you guys learned anything about relational tables and using foreign keys yet in your MySQL class? So parent-child relationship, I have books, a book has an author, right? The parent is the author, the books are the children. Have you learned that kind of relationship yet? Okay, so it's very possible that I might have to teach that to you depending on which database teacher you have. Andrew likes to take it a little slower with the select statements and Ben likes to kind of motor along a little bit. So you may be out of sync, not a big deal. It's an easy lesson. It won't take us long to actually learn, but we don't need to get to that right yet. All right, cool. Let's talk about, mm, let's talk about partials. I think that's the first topic we need to actually discuss. So I'm just going to navigate to our lesson plan so you can see the actual lesson plan. The link is in um, underneath the weekly learning. So what are partials? You guys know what a function is, right? You've written tons and tons of functions. Yeah. Uh, how many of you have written classes? You have a JavaScript class right now, or a Java class, right? And you guys are starting to create class objects, right? You know what the purpose of those things are, right? They're to basically take code that you're gonna wind up typing multiple times and they turn it and encapsulate it so that you write it once and then you can reuse it, right? That's the whole idea. So that's fine for code, but as programmers, your brain starts to look at HTML and go, my God, I am typing the same chunk of HTML 19 times. There's got to be a better way. There's gotta be a way that I can just take this HTML I've coded one time and then stick it into other files. And yes, there is called includes. So includes comes from C. C has this ability that you can take a file and literally copy its contents programmatically. Like you don't have to actually physically copy them. You copy them programmatically 
and dump them into another file wherever you want inside the file using a statement called include. And PHP has adopted that as well. It has four different ways to include a file. The two ways that we're going to discuss are include and include one. Include will copy the contents of a file and paste it in and not care. Doesn't care about what it's doing. You, anywhere you put that include statement, it will paste those contents. Include once will first scan the file, see if the content has already been included, and if it has, it will ignore it and move on. If it hasn't, then it will copy the contents and paste them into the file. Both of these you will wind up using, depending on what you're doing. Say you have a little list right, and you want that list to appear three or four times on the page, obviously you would want to use include because you need that list to appear multiple times. Say you have an HTML header, right, with the doc type and the HTML opening tag and all those type of things. Do you want those multiple times on the page? No, you only need to do it once. So you're gonna use include once to avoid that from being duplicated accidentally somewhere else in code. <clears throat> so, I've already actually taken a lot of the files that we have and I've turned them into partials. And basically what a partial is, it's just a fancy word for a chunk of HTML. That's really what a partial is, just a chunk of HTML. Partials are a little different than includes. Includes are utilities. These are just naming schemes, by the way. These are just names that people make up, but most people use. Includes are like utilities. So we have one include file. If you look at the side structure here, I'm just gonna zoom in a little bit so that you can see. If you look at this side structure, we have an includes directory. And in the includes directory, we have a connect.php file. If you open that file, you'll notice we have no HTML in this file whatsoever, not even a little bit. Includes are not something somebody can see visually right? They're usually meant as just the utility. So say you create a function and you love this function because this function solves a problem for your application. And you need this function in every single file you have in your application because you're going to use it every single time. Then that function would exist in your includes directory. That's a good place for that function. It's a utility thing that you want to use. Partials. Partials are visual. There's something that a user can see, right? There's something that you include and then you can go visually see it in your browser because it's made up of HTML. It might have PHP in it as well, but the end point is to deliver a visual component, right? So in here, you can see we have our header. Our header will contain basically the content of the top part of our HTML page, basically from the doc type to the opening tag of body. That's our header. So all the CSS we define in there, any meta tags we define in there, like our titles or our links or anything like that will all be in there. And we will be taking that chunk and including it at the top of any HTML file we have. The next piece, footer. Footer is obviously the bottom of the file. It's basically from the closing body tag down to the closing HTML tag. And it's that whole chunk including any JavaScript that you might have in the lower part of the body, any footers or any information like that. Basically, both pieces are completely reusable. In addition to our header, we also have a main nav. Our main nav is the navigation that we're going to use in our application for getting around our application. As a partial, partials make main navs kind of handy because sometimes you will have a public navigation, which is what the general public sees. You'll have an authenticated navigation, which is what somebody logged in will see. And then you might have an administrative navigation, which is what an administrator would see. So you have like different roles in navigation. We're going to do it a little different. We're going to use helpers to basically define whether a user is logged in. And if they are, we're going to hide stuff, right? And last is this one that might not make a lot of sense. You might never have seen before. It's called Flash. How many here have ever heard of flash notifications? No? It's actually something that you're gonna see quite a bit as you get into the industry. 
what a flash notification is is when I do some sort of operation that affects my account, whether I'm reading information, writing information, it's usually something destructive, right? Like creating, updating, or deleting. I need something to tell me that what I've done has worked as a user. I, I can't go look at the database code and tell, right? Like you don't want to open up your database code to general users. So you need some way to inform them that yes, you logged in successfully. Yes, you logged out successfully. You created a new user account. That failed. That was a problem. You have an error. You need some way to communicate with your user. So the way we do that is we do it through a flash partial. We create this little partial that basically listens for messages. And when the messages come in, it spits them out to the user and tells them what the message is. Flash notification can get very, very complex where you actually get into things like push notifications, which use a whole socket server and a whole bunch of other stuff, and it gets really, really ridiculous. Ours, super, super simple. <laughs> so simple, it's not even funny. In fact, that file is basically just a view. It's what it will wind up being. It'll just be a view. That's it. Won't contain really any huge PHP stuff. And then we're just going to basically um, check a variable on each load. Essentially, it's what's going to happen. <laughs> includes or partials in this scenario partials can live inside other partials so you can actually include a partial inside a partial so for example our main nav is going to be at the top of every single page that we work with now we could on every HTML page include the header and include the main nav but what would make a lot more sense is just to include the main nav directly in the header file then we're only including one file, not two. Same with the flash. We need the flash in literally every HTML file because when we have a message, we want to not have to care about where we are in order to give the user the message. We should be able to give that user the message anywhere we are, right? So obviously we need it to exist in a more global location. The easiest place to put that, again, is in the header. So we're going to take our flash we're going to take our main nav and we're going to put them in our header files so that we can easily access them. Partials have one slight flaw. Actually, all includes in PHP have one slight flaw. When you put, when you put a file inside another file, when you include it inside another file, the directory structure that you're using for the path gets kind of muddled because the path starts from the file that is loaded. So for example, I have an index file, right? And my index file is embedded under my users. So if you were to go to users, index, this file right here. So it's sitting there and I wanna put my header file inside this file. In order to do that, I have to navigate outside of users, so dot, dot. I want to move into partials, slash, come down through partials, and include my header. No worries. So it's dot, dot, slash, underscore, header, dot, PHP, and now it's included. But in my header file, I have included my main nav and my footer. Or sorry, not my footer, my flash. In order to include the main nav in my header file, I have include, and it's in the same directory as the header. So I have dot slash underscore main nav. Remember this stuff, when we include it, it's literally a copy and a paste. So when that path gets evaluated from this user's directory, it's going to go, cool, I found header, no worries. I'm gonna copy that content. Oh, you have other stuff you wanna copy and paste. Cool, we'll copy and paste that, dump it in. Now I'm ready to evaluate this path. It starts at dot, which means from the file I'm currently in. Even though we declared that in header, it gets confused. It doesn't realize that we're in header. It thinks we're in index. So it's gonna start here, and it's gonna look for the main nav and it's not gonna find it because it doesn't exist in here. 
So what we have to do is we have to create a way to centralize our paths. We need to centralize our file root path, and we need to centralize our HTML request path. So both those pieces will need to be centralized. There's a good write-up that I wrote about why we do this, why it's common in these type of applications. Uh, there are ways around this type of stuff, but it means a lot more complicated, um, a lot more complicated view delivery system in order to do it. So our first step tonight, our very first step is to create our centralized path. The good news is, is that Monday took the brunt of this. And basically any errors we had, we solved yesterday. So this should go relatively quickly tonight. In the root of your starter files, you will see an underscore config.php file. I want you to go ahead and open that. <coughs> this is where we're gonna define our centralized path. Now I'm gonna close off my row here. Actually, I might be able to go smaller. That should still be visible, hopefully. If not, move up. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is define the directory root. So when we do an include, it actually wants the C colon slash slash blah, 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 blah. It wants to know where in your file system that file exists. That's what it wants, okay? So we need to be able to replicate that. The good news is, is that PHP already has the tools in place for us to do that. So we're gonna learn a little bit of something new called a constant. You guys have heard of constants, right? You define a constant, the whole idea of a constant is it's constant, it never changes. Once you define the value, it never changes. That's the idea. PHP doesn't have a nice way to define constants. It's kind of convoluted for no reason. They have a function called define. Define takes two arguments. The first is the symbol name that you wanna call your constant as a string. So we're gonna call our constant root, which is gonna define our root path basically. The second argument to the constant is the value that you want to initialize the constant with. So do comma, space, and then our value, our value needs to be our file path where this file is currently located. So we're looking at the file path where config is. It is intentional that config is sitting in the root of our directory, of our actual lesson. That's intentional because we wanna basically start our paths from that directory. All paths that we're gonna use are gonna start from this directory. Gives us kind of a home base, like a home point, right? So this is gonna look like dir name, and then it's going to take something called a magic constant. I'm not making it up, that's what it's called. It's a magic constant. It's underscore, underscore, that's two of them. You should hopefully see a list that appears, and the one we want is file. So that's underscore, underscore. So what the heck is all of this? How to do a good presentation. Erase the board when you're done. <laughs> so it's underscore, underscore, F, I, L, E, underscore, underscore. So two underscores. I mean, you type one, you should see it's a little thinner than it needs to be, right? So that's our magic constant. What that file magic constant does is it literally returns back the current location of that directory and file path. I think the easiest way to tell that is to actually see it. So let's do a echo statement in here and we'll just echo out that magic constant so we can see it. <laughs> so you're just echoing out underscore, underscore, file, underscore, underscore. My ID, unfortunately, puts the underscores so close together, they look like they're one character, but they are not. If you look at my cursor, it's sitting in between the two of them. Once you've done that, 
jump over to your browser and let's navigate to this bad boy. Let's go to localhost, comp-1006 and hit enter. That will load up all of our lesson folders that we have. You should have four. I've got 94. Click on lesson four and your page should load. I think I clicked on the wrong one, actually. No, I did. Tuesday. That's correct. Okay. I want to navigate to where that partial is. Sorry, it's not a partial. It's our config. So I'm literally just going to request it up here. I'm going to type in underscore config.php in my browser and hit enter. So if you notice, the value of underscore, underscore, file, underscore, underscore is literally the path to the config file that we're in. It's that same path. So we can actually use this to our advantage because I want the root of my path to be less than four, right? So I want that to be the root of my path and I can get there by basically just getting rid of the underscore config.php and then I have it permanently set. So the way I do that, I use dir name. Let's wrap this file in dir name. And I mean, it's likely it's already given away to you what it does, but essentially it will return back the directory it is currently in. So it truncates out the file and it just returns back the directory structure that it's in. So now if you jump back to your browser, hit control R, you can see the name of the file is gone and we're now just in our directory. That's cool, that's exactly what we want. So now what we do is we just take our config file, include it in every place that we wanna actually start from the root of our directory structure and now we have this path available to us by simply calling root. So let me just demonstrate that. Let's take off this and just call root. Now you'll notice the difference. When we define the constant, we use a string, but once it's defined, we just use the symbol name. <clears throat> Incidentally, a lot of people don't actually know that. This is called a symbol name, constants, the, the name, the label you give them, they're called symbol names, uh, variables. The name you give your variable is called a symbol name. And functions, right, the actual name you give the function, that's a symbol. And classes, those names you give your classes, your methods, your properties, those are all called symbols, just so you're aware. Comes in handy when you know that, when you start getting into other languages that actually use that terminology more. Anyway, so we're going to echo root, refresh, no change, because it's literally that value, right? Cool. The problem is, is that if I want to create an anchor link, I can't be like, hey, I want to go to C colon slash because the browser is going to come back and go, dude, slow your roll. There is no C drive. I don't know what C means. Give me a HTML path. Either start it with HTTP www dot blah, or give me just a directory and I will go there. But I don't want to see your C colon. I don't care about that. I just want the directory path that I need to go to. And that has a lot to do with Apache because Apache will not let you access files that are outside of its directory structure. So it doesn't want you to start with the C colon piece. PHP works a little different. PHP is like, yeah, we'll include files wherever you want them included from, we don't care, but I need the whole directory path in order to get there. Apache wants just an HTML path. So if you want to keep this here, you can. Just make sure you comment it out because you don't want it showing up in all your files. And the quick way to comment that out, by the way, is control and forward slash, which actually is in this direction. See, you can just turn it off and on. <clears throat> now I'm ready to define my HTML path. Now this is a slight bit of hackery that we're going to do to do this. And I wonder if I should do this in two pieces because it definitely was confusing for people yesterday. Um, yeah, we'll do this in two pieces. We're going to create a variable 
called intersect. So dollar sign intersect. And what essentially I'm going to do is I'm going to take the value of root. I'm going to basically look in there and remove the first chunk of it so that I only wind up with slash less than four. And then I'm going to stick the word comp-1006 in front of it. And I'm going to do it with one function called string replace. So that looks like this. str underscore replace. That's the function. The first argument of that function is what you're looking for. It's literally, what do you want to find? What is the thing you're looking for? And so I'm going to say, well, I'm looking for dir name, underscore, underscore, dir, underscore, underscore. <clears throat> now, dir name file return back less than four, right? We, we basically had c colon, whatever, up to less than four, right? So let's, let's take a look at that. I'm going to write a whole bunch of echo statements here with some breaks in between them. So I have root, right, which is the value of this thing here, okay? And why don't we write this like this? Root colon Oops. There. We'll write it like that. Nice concatenated statement. These are dots, by the way, not commas. Those are dots. Then I'm going to keep my cursor next to it, and I'm going to hit Alt-Shift and press down, and that will duplicate the line. So that's Alt-Shift and down. And then I'm going to replace the middle of this with dir name, underscore, underscore, dir, underscore, underscore. And I'm going to change the root to dir. Okay. This is just essentially going to create the sentence root, put the variable in there, the value of the variable in there, and then cause a break tag. This is going to say dir, the variable, and then a break tag. So that we can easily see what we're doing. Not a big deal if you type it out. I'm really just using it to explain it. I'm going to jump over to the browser. I apologize. I know some of you are still typing. Oh, hold on. I'm going to comment out the string replace because it's going to blow up. So we'll just comment out intersect for now. All right. <clears throat> I only want less than four. So when I go to write my anchor link, I want to start at less than four for every single link that I create. I don't want the C colon WAMP64 www content of six. So what I want to do is I want to take the value of directory and I want to replace that chunk that's in root with a new value. That's where string replace comes in. I say to string replace, look for this inside that and then replace it with this thing. So uncomment the string replace. I'm just going to close this so you guys can actually see what I'm writing here. The first value is what we're looking for, the thing we're looking for. And we're looking for that comp 1006 endpoint, right? The second value is what we want to replace with. Well, we're going to replace with slash comp dash 1006 is what we're going to replace it with. And then the last value is where we want to look for it, and that is in root. So the first value is what we're looking for. The second value is what we're going to replace it with. And the third value is the thing we're looking in, right? Better known as needle, haystack, and what we're replacing with. So now that you've done that, if you 
spit out the value of this. So we're going to do echo intersect dot dollar sign intersect. And we don't need to print a break tag this time because it's the last line we're writing. <clears throat> if this works, we should see slash comp dash 1006 slash lesson dash 04 is what we should wind up with in the end. Good. All right. Jump over to the browser, hit refresh, and that's perfect. Just ignore the direction of the splashes. It doesn't matter. Windows doesn't care. But you see what happened? It took our directory and it basically deleted that line out of the root and left us with less than 04 and then replaced it with the comp 1006 value that we put into place in the string replace. Super handy and creates us a new variable that we can use as a base path in our code, which is what we need. Good news is, if this kind of is confusing, that's totally okay. This is something that will likely be set up by a DevOps person anyways, and not necessarily you. The only things you need to concern yourself is that these exist and that you know what their values are. So we're gonna create a new um, constant called base path. And its value is going to be intersect. So we have two values altogether. We have the root and we have base path. Now, before we take a break, what I would like to do is take this file, put it into our nav, and then go fix all the roots in our nav because right now all the roots in our nav are located in the wrong location because they're all relative. We wanna make them from relative to what's known as absolute. Absolute means it has the full directory structure it needs to get where it's going and it's not using relative paths where it's currently located. Relative paths are bad unless you have foolproof plan to deal with them because you can wind up with the whole includes issues where things are included in places and you're not sure where they're navigating from and it becomes a severe headache. This cleans that up and makes that much easier for us. All right, so let's, uh, anybody still typing just before I navigate from here? No, you're still typing? Yeah, I'll give you a few seconds to finish there. Actually, did you sign up for Slack? Cool, let's, let's use the Slack. Copy, not whatever I just clicked, stop. Never go over to Slack. Just gotta sign in again. You see, you see, comp studies. All right, I'm gonna put this under the 1006 folder here. I'm gonna create a new post. I'm going to paste it in there, and this is going to be called underscore config.php. Create the snippet. Boom. Just go there, click on it, highlight the stuff, hit control C, and paste it in the file. There we go. We're going to do that again with the nav because the nav is stupid big. It's so big. Um, I'm going to show you an interesting trick. You can navigate through your files to find the file you're looking for by using the sidebar, right? But that's for amateurs. We're professionals. Close that sidebar. You don't need that. Hit control P on your keyboard. Control P opens this little flyout. And now you can search for files. I want the index file under users. So I type users space index. Boom. There it is. I want the config file that we were in. Cool, I'll just do config, oh, there it is. And I don't even have to type out the whole word, just part of it. I want the main nav, main nav, there it is. Boom, it's open. 
Troll Pete, best friend. Absolute best friend. <clears throat> all right. Step one, add the base path to all the URLs. Well, that's a direct lie that it's not step one. Step one is include the config file that we need to use. So we're going to do that first. We're going to include our config file. <clears throat> so to include our config file, we're going to use PHP, a nice little inline structure for PHP. And now let's think about this for a second. We're going to have a header that's going to have this include in it, right? We're going to have other files that are going to contain this include, but we only ever want to include the main nav how many times in one view? Unos. One time. No more than one time. So because of that, am I using include or include once? Exactly. Include once because we don't want to accidentally include it more than once. So we're going to use the include once function. So that's cool. Now I just need to give it the path. That's the argument it wants. It wants the path locating our file. This time we can actually use a relative URL. We're totally okay to do that. So we're going to do quotes dot dot slash underscore config dot PHP. Actually, that's bad. Let's not do that. Let's make this cleaner. Let's get rid of those two dots. We're going to use dir name, underscore, underscore, dir, underscore, underscore, and concatenate it using the dot. That's better. That is an absolute path and not a relative path. And that is a dot, not a comma. A lot of people would write comma, but it's not. It's a dot. Like a period, like a dot, that thing. All right, now we're ready to do some very tedious, annoying work. We're going to add the word base path to everything. But of course, Sean has an IDE trick to make this really stupid simple, right? I've got to write base path like 16 times. There's no way in heck I have that much energy. So make sure you put your cursor where I tell you to. Out of curiosity, who is not using visual code? What are you using though? Adam, you might have a problem. I couldn't figure out how to get multi-cursor working in Adam. Do you know how to do multi-cursor? Okay, <laughs> um, so you might have to type them all out. What we're gonna look for is anywhere there's a href that has a path, not a hashtag. If it has a hashtag, just ignore it and move on. But if it has a path, we need to put our cursor there. So what I'm gonna do, we'll start on line six. Actually, first thing I want you to do on line six, see where it says SM, change that to your initials. Change it from SM to your initials, whatever your initials are. Okay? I'll even change mine because I'll add my middle initial, which is C for Cameron. <clears throat> Can't get much more Scottish than that. Sean Cameron McKinnon. My God, it almost sounds Scottish as you say it. All right. I'm going to put my cursor on line six in front of that slash. Let it blink for a second. And then, super important you hear me, you're gonna use Alt. And then wherever you click next, it's gonna create a new cursor and keep the old cursor. So I wanna find the next place before I do it. Uh, the next place is on line, I thought there was another one after this one. 14, yep, line 14. So hold down Alt and click just in front of the splash on line 14. And now just notice I have two blinking cursors. Okay. Now we'll test this so that we don't write it, you know, we don't put six blinking cursors in and make a mistake. We'll do this test. Write a less than symbol, a question mark, and an equal sign. Hit space and then write a question mark and a greater than symbol. 
and then bring your cursor back using your arrow keys so that it's in between them. The next step is for us to simply write the base path in, which is literally just the word base path. And you might be like, well, Sean, where's this, where's this coming from? This is coming from the config file that we included, where we defined it. That's where it's coming from. So that's cool. We wrote it in two spots simultaneously, super easy, right? We wrote it at the exact same time. For those of you that don't have multipath, let me highlight the two spots that we actually put it in. That's what you're typing. And those are the two locations you're doing it in. Line six and line 14. This thing right here where it says my house, you don't have to say my house. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. Change it. I don't care. Change it to home if you want something a little bit more professional. I mean, it's your portfolio. So you change it to whatever you want. But basically, that's the home page. That's what that link is for. That's to the home page. All right. Anybody still typing? No? Awesome. Let's scroll down and find the next one. Oh, there's three right in a row. Perfect. I'm going to click and put my cursor next to the about. Hold Alt next to Contacts, and then next to Users. So I'm going to put it in three locations. Oh, now we're getting real fancy. Less than, question mark, equals, not plus, equals, question mark, greater than. Bring my cursor in here. Base path. Nice and quick. So that is on line 17, 20, and 23. Anybody still typing? Yeah? Are you using the multi-cursor? Nice. How do you guys like Canadian weather? 34 degrees today. Yesterday was 15. Today is 34. <laughs> That's Canada. <laughs> Gets like that for a good chunk for a while. Then winter hits. And you don't want to be outside for very long because <laughs> it's like minus 40. It's super cold. Have you guys had a winter here yet? No? Oh, poor you. <laughs> poor you. All right. We good? We're there? Cushy, is she there? Are you there? We're good? Awesome. Let's move down. We don't want to do this one. This is a hashtag. We don't care about hashtags. They're for Kardashians only. Scroll down further. On line 30, let's put our cursor and next to the users, hold alt and do it to the next one on line 31. And again, the same thing. Let's so line 30 and 31. Now, like I said, I am super lazy. So I would have likely wrote, written this once and then multi-copied and pasted it. Want to know how to do that? That's super cool. Take any one of them, whatever one you want, highlight it, and hit Control-C to copy it. Okay? Just one of them. Just copy one of them. Once you have it copied, scroll down, and you're going to see we have three of them. We have one beside sessions. I'm going to hold Alt, 
click beside the one beside users and hold alt and click the one on line 49 as well. Three different places. Now, instead of typing out the lesson, whatever, all I'm gonna do is hit control V and paste it in three locations at once. And that is on line 38, line 43, and line 49. I will tell you right now, knowing how to use your IDE, when you go in for your co-op placements, right, and you go, most of you will wind up like a little test. They usually do like a little test. If you know how to navigate your IDE, jump from file to file quickly, navigate through your file using just your keys without your mouse, understanding how to do things like multi-select, multi-paste, multi-copy, all those type of things, which make you so much faster, you will be very hireable <laughs> knowing how to do that. People will want to hire you because you understand your IDE and you're not being held back by your tool. You're actually using your tool to help you, right? So it's definitely worthwhile learning these little shortcuts. I know I use them daily. There's never a time I don't use them. And I think that was the last one. So we have line 49. Now I'm gonna show you something else interesting. I wanna find all instances of this. So now I just hold control and hit control D and I've copied every single one of them. I've highlighted every single one of them. So now I can go through and we can see where they all are. So let's just make sure. So line 49, you should have one. Line 43, line 38, line 31, line 30, line 23, line 20, line 17, line 14, and line six. Should be all of them. Bingo, right? Cool. Why don't we take a small, uh, no, let's navigate to the page, make sure it works, and then we'll take a small break. So open up your browser. We get there by going to slash partials. Okay. So Tuesday 04 partials. And you should see the flash footer, header, and main nav. Just click on the main nav. You won't see all the styles because we don't have any of the styles in place. But what you should see, if you hover, you should see localhost, comp-1006, lesson 04 Tuesday. It's what you should see on that one. If you hover over about me, you should see the about me link, contact, my profile, all those type of things. Let's just test one of the links to make sure they work. Click on the about me link, and you should see the page. It should navigate. Your nav will look a little different because mine shrunk, so it's all in there right now. I'll make it so it's not. There, that's what it should look like. Cool. Why don't we take a 10 minute break? Uh, just before we do that, I've elected you guys to do my survey. Every semester I have to choose a class. Your hands down, my favorite class. So I selected you guys to do the survey. You will get a link. Obviously, the more people that fill out the surveys and give me feedback, the better I can change my course and, you know, learn from what you're trying to say. Uh, so I selected you guys. You should get a link in the next week or so. If you haven't already gotten it, please fill out that survey. It's definitely worthwhile. Helps the college understand what you need. Helps me understand what you need. Okay? So I selected you guys to do that. Cool. Let's take a 10-minute break. So we have our main nav, we have config, looks like everybody's got running applications. All is hunky-dory and good. Let's just double check and see if that's true. I'm gonna go to my house. In my house, I load up my index file properly. You should have a working index file without a whole bunch of errors. How many of you have errors when you go to the homepage, just out of curiosity? So a few of you. All right, so I just want to quickly see, I'll just check your machine, man. See what your error is and see if it's just a configuration issue. So object not found, that is super, super weird. Is localhost comp 1006 your actual directory? Yeah, COM1006. 
No, it's an under. No, yeah, it's an underscore. Go back. You have a dash. Yeah, no worries. <clears throat> so if you want to make that super simple on yourself, the easiest way to do that is either rename the directory to comp dash 10 to 06. That'd probably be the simplest way. Or where we actually built that base path, change that to comp underscore 10 06. Yep. We find variable intersect. So that is on in here. No, nope, go back. Because you called it intersect. You need oh, to yeah. put the C in place. Where was another one? Yeah, these errors, thank God, are just little ones. I can't see. Uh, not found. Yeah, so do you notice how it changes the entire directory when you go back? Click your back button. Nope, go back into your, your browser. Click your back button. Look at the URL that you've got. Comp 1006, lesson four starter files, lesson four. You need to take that directory out of the lesson four starter files, like I said before. Why don't you give me your laptop and I'll do that for you right now. So that way we have it done and you don't have to worry about it. Because you're, you're, you're recessed too many directories in is the problem. See, you've got it sitting in here like so. And this is the directory you're trying to access, right? So we're gonna come up a directory. We're gonna paste this in here. That's the directory we want to work with. These two need to be deleted once you know that your code is over, okay? I thought I fixed yours. I thought we fixed yours up there. Okay, so you're fine now. Okay, let me see if I did. So your issue is it's actually loading the content of six folder twice. The reason why that's happening it's under your config file. This You need this beginning slash that basically says just this thing, not this thing and more things. Now we can navigate back, hit control R, everything's golden. No worries. All right, one more. Uh, yeah, I don't care about the config file. That I don't care about for right a second. Uh, let's just make sure we can load the index file. Okay, so unexpected defined T string on line four. That likely means that the issue is a semicolon issue. Um, no. So this has to do with the copy and paste. It seems to be causing an, this weird kind of enter line character that isn't showing up in the IDE but it's Slack's fault. It's, it's weird. It's like there's a new line character that Windows doesn't understand, and it's just like, yeah, fuck no. <laughs> and it just dies. Yeah, same with you. Here, let me see. Uh, use of undefined constant. So you're using underscore DIR underscore. It's actually underscore underscore DIR underscore underscore. Two underscores. Yeah. Um, a few people had that same issue. So this is correct. <clears throat> it's probably in your main nav. Yes. So you need two underscores. Super confusing on PHP's part, but that's the way it is. There you go. Yeah, it can be. <clears throat> All right, good? Nice. Let's do this. So right off the bat, you probably noticed that your name is not Sean McKinnon, but your screen says Sean McKinnon, right? I mean, it could be Sean McKinnon if you want your name to be my name. That's totally fine. Let's use our magic fingers. Control P, because we're not amateurs. We're going to navigate to the file we want using Control P. I want the index.php. You'll notice that you have two options, one under users and then this one. We want that one. We want the one that's not under users. Hit enter, should look like this. So you'll see this variable called Sean McKinnon's Portfolio Full Stack Developer Home. So let's fix that. You guys are not front end developers. You wanna be paid more money than that. <laughs> you guys are going to be full stack developers when you get out of here. So your income expectations should be between 60,000 and 120,000 per year, okay? That's your income expectation. A front-end developer wants between 40,000 
and 100,000 per year, but it takes them a lot longer to get there. You guys are going to have all the programming skills you need to start as a full stack developer. That's your title. Or software engineer. One of those two. Okay? So if you want to be called software engineer, change this to software engineer. My current position at G-Shift is senior software engineer. You guys, what I would call yourselves is intermediate. Or you can do junior, but I mean, don't sell yourself short, right? Intermediate sounds better. Then, obviously, you don't want it called Sean McKinnon's portfolio. Call it your name, right? What this is going to change, you know the tab at the top of our browser, you know like where your website is? There's that little tab, and in that tab, there's some words in there. It's going to change those words. However, those words are super, super important. I'm not sure if I told you guys what I do for a living. I, I scrape Google. I build uh, marketing tools for search engine optimization companies. Um, so obviously I know about search engine optimization because I have to build the tools that you use to edit this stuff. And I can tell you the only characters that Google cares about are the first 65 characters in your title. So those 65 characters need to have your name 100%. Okay. The characters after that, not nearly as important, but those 65 characters, super important. So make sure you have your name. All right. Scroll down a little further. This is what's going to show up on the page. So obviously you're going to want to change this to whatever you want. It would actually be advisable for your H1 to be the same as your tab heading. And you know what's cool? We can do that literally in the simplest fashion possible by putting an inline PHP echo statement and spitting out the value of title. Right? Why not just use it in two places? So whatever you set title to will immediately be your H1. So Google looks at 165 characters for your H1. When it loads it into your search results and your name comes up, it looks at that H1 tag. Just to prove that, Sean McKinnon's portfolio at seanmckinnon.ca. It's grabbing this. When I click on it, if Heroku is down again, I swear to God, I'm going to scream. There we go. So it's grabbing it from my H1 tag. From right here, Sean McKinnon. Actually, I think it's grabbing it from my title tag. Uh, yeah, it's grabbing it from my title tag. So that SERP, that's what they're called, search engine results. That SERP, this title, comes from your title tag. So whatever your title tag is what's going to show up in Google. Your H1 is going to be a part of your description down here, plus any other details like contact Sean McKinnon, blah, 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 right? All that information is so super important, and you want your portfolio to sell you. So that's the whole idea. So let's just put our title right there. Okay, cool. <laughs> I've already done this page for you. We are going to do the steps that are in this page in other pages though. So don't feel like you're losing out. I just want to give you something to basically go home and start filling out so that you can start applying for your co-op positions because your co-op positions start next semester, right? So you want to be able to like start adding in your code and everything else. So these pages are completed for you. I gave you three. I gave you an index page. I gave you a contact page and I gave you an about page, okay? Those are totally on you. You do whatever you want with that. We're not going to do, we will do something to them later uh, when we actually create little blocks of dynamic text that we can put into there, like your skills, your uh, past experience, stuff like that, okay? The idea is that when we're done, it won't look quite like this, not quite to this extent, but kind of the same idea. We'll have portfolio pieces, your skills, I have quite a few, 
uh, your historical timeline, so you can actually see what you've been doing over the years. This needs to be drastically updated. Your work experience, right? And then a contact page for you, okay? The good news is too, is all of this, I don't have any design experience whatsoever. This is all bootstrap. This is 100% bootstrap, okay? So all this stuff is bootstrap plus some colors from somewhere. I did make this pretty picture though. I think it looks cool, but anyways, I did make that. Okay. Cool. Let's do, not that. Let's do problems with using parallels. The Mac bar keeps jumping up at me. Uh, let's do a index and show all of our users. Now, we already did that in this class, so I don't wanna go through that code again. So we're gonna copy and paste the code from the lesson plan and then dump it directly in because we've already done it. So there's no reason for us to go over it again a second time. Wow, this class cleared out. Holy crap. <laughs> that might be a good thing. <laughs> All right, go to users, go to index.php under users and open that file or control P users index. Okay, there'll be a big empty file. So obviously we're not gonna do step eight. So step eight is not necessary. And you know what, it's been a couple of weeks, so why don't we just quickly write this out because it's only gonna take a few seconds. We need to include our connect script. Notice I've already included our config for us. So we already have that file in place. We're hunky-dory. Why don't we navigate to this page in our browsers by using our new menu, users, view all users and that will take us to this horrible page right now so you'll notice we have no styles right all the styles are gone there's nothing there so obviously we're missing some core pieces that we need we're missing our header which contains all our styling and we're missing our footer which contains all our javascript stuff so we need to make sure those things get put in there so let's do that now scroll down to where it says step three yep If you go to users, index.php, that's where you're going. And it should look like that. Do you have an index.php under users and there's nothing in it? Under the users directory, you should only have index.php in there, plus form, create, new, and show. Let me see, because maybe you just moved your files around accidentally. So you have your users directory that's not open, <laughs> and this is the file you're looking for. That one's the root of your application. You know what, that's not a bad thing to actually explain. The way PHP, the way the web works in general, indexes are automatically assumed. Like they're just like, Cool, you wanna to go to this directory? Oh, I see an index file, so I'll load it for you, even though you didn't ask for it. So when you're actually navigating in your browser to slash users, it's immediately going to index.php. You can type it in, that's totally fine. There's no difference. But when you just go to slash, it automatically assumes you wanna to go to index.php by default. So when you have an application, what you will often see you will see an index file at the root. So that way when the person navigates to your website, they have somewhere to land, right? So they land on that index.php page right off the get-go. They only have to go to slash users. They don't actually have to go to the index.php or it's not slash users, just to your website. But you can actually create multiple directories with multiple index.phps in each one of those directories and basically create like a default location for them to land. Often you'll see WordPress actually takes full advantage of that. WordPress creates all these multiple subdirectories and really what they're doing is creating index.php files, but it makes this nice pretty URL, right? Because you go there and it's just like, you know, my first blog, right? And it's just a pretty URL with a nice slash at the end of it. But really what's happening is there's a folder called my first blog and there's an index.php file in that folder. That's what's happening, right? There are other things you can do called rewrites. 
and stuff like that, but that gets quite a bit more complicated. But there's like the poor man's version of this, which is just putting index.php under folders that have nice names. So that's what we're kind of doing here. So that users, this is the one you want open. All right, I need to close this side panel. We're gonna scroll down to step three, which is on line 27. Sorry, it's actually on line 28. Put your cursor next to the PHP. We're going to include the header.php file so that it loads up on our page. So important you pay attention to this because obviously if you title it wrong, you won't get the right file, right? So the first thing we need to do is use those centralized paths we created. So we're gonna use root. That's gonna make our lives so much easier. Root is gonna literally simplify everything we're doing. We're gonna use root. We're gonna press the dot character, which is a concat. It literally says, take the next thing and add it to this thing. So I do like the Java way and the JavaScript way, which is the plus sign, makes so much more sense. But PHP, it's a dot. So root, dot, and then our path. So our path is going to be slash partials slash underscore header dot PHP. And it's actually just written right here anyway. Make sure you have that underscore, just a single underscore, not doubles. All right. I don't think I showed you guys code folding. Uh, IDEs generally support something called code folding. What it basically is, is it's just visual. It's not like your code disappears, it's not gone. It just visually collapses it so that you can kind of get to different spots in your code. If you put your cursor over to the left-hand side, you'll see these little arrows that are pointing down. If you click the one next to the div class container, it'll collapse all that for us. It's still there, because if you click it again, it appeared. So you can just, see? just visual. We're gonna do step seven here where it says include the footer. I don't tend to do things in order. I do them in logical order, which you think I would write the stupid steps in logical order then. <laughs> slash partials slash underscore footer dot PHP. <clears throat> so now we have a header and we have a footer. Yeah, yeah. So now that we have the header and we have the footer, we can actually navigate to the user's page, hit refresh, and we should see all of our styles take over. So just go to the user's page, hit refresh, refresh. What are you doing? Uh, That's super weird. That is super, super weird. All right, um, let's view our page source. Yeah, we're missing the whole header and we're missing the whole footer. The heck am I editing then? Because it looks like I didn't even touch this file. Hold on, maybe I've got the wrong file open? That doesn't make any sense. Lesson four Tuesday. Lesson for Tuesday users. In the correct directory, did I hit Control S? I did. We're including this thing or it would throw a nice big error. Let's just make double sure, hold on. Whoops. We're definitely in the correct file. So that gets even weirder. So it is possible I'm not loading this config file then. I have the partials. I am super confused to why those are not showing up properly. Huh. Huh. 
Yeah, it's like there's nothing in them. Maybe there isn't anything in them. Maybe they're empty. Yeah, it could be the path itself. The These paths are exactly the way they should be. It should be root dot and then the partials and then the header. If these didn't exist, like for example, if I did headers and then refresh, notice I'm not getting an error at all. It's like it's not even loading the included file. Like it's like it doesn't even exist. So let's see if we can throw an error. There we go. So we can throw the error to fail this. Let me see if I can get this to load up. Unless it's being loaded somewhere else and I'm forgetting. That is super weird. Let me try restarting all services. It is possible it could be cached. Highly unlikely, but it could be. Let's look at the network tab. Oh yeah, not even loading the the CSS whatsoever. Oh. It is a very, very long day. Include would be very helpful in this statement. Wow, sorry guys, so sorry. Include, I mean, I have one job <laughs> to spit out the right code. There we go. <laughs> Include is super important because includes what tells you to copy and paste these pieces, right? Without include, it does not work. <laughs> For those of you that just came in, I've collapsed my code using code folding. I have not deleted or removed code, just collapsed it. All right, now, ta-da, that's better. Notice we have our nav, we have users, and we have this big block that says, no users, perhaps you should create a new one. Well, that's actually a blatant lie. We have users, we're just not loading them in, right? The thing that's taking care of that for us right now is down here, this block right here where it gives us an alert and tells us no users and there's stuff in there. Nice, pretty, just, just bootstrap. No CSS, no extra stuff. So why don't we actually go and get our users, right? That makes sense. Step one, get the users by including the connect script. Well, we'll do this properly using the word include. <laughs> Let's do include once so we don't accidentally include it more than once. We need root. And then our include script for the connect is under the folder includes underscore connect.php. That's where we'll find that. And then I have this huge chunk of commenting, which is just in my way. So I'm literally going to remove it all because I just can't deal with it. You can leave yours in there if you want. I just don't want it in my way. Remember how I said when we include something, it copies the contents of that file and dumps it in, like literally pastes it in, right? You may not remember, but when we created our connect script a few weeks ago, we have this variable called dollar sign con. When we do this include, that dollar sign con is now available to us at the global level, it's basically like a global variable almost. So we can use that to connect to our database, get our users, do everything we need to do, 
and then get out, okay? First thing we're gonna do is create the SQL statement. And this is super easy. You guys have been writing this all week. I want to get all of the users in the users table. What is my SQL statement? I wanna get all of the users that are in the users table. Not include, select, not all, star, yep. From, don't need to write tables. I want users, so users, exactly. There you go. In the end, we got there. <laughs> select star from users. We'll literally take all of the records inside the MySQL table users and return it back to you. So right now, we're just writing a sentence. That's all we're doing. Select star from users. That's all we're doing. Just a sentence, just a string. This has no meaning yet. Not till we actually do something with it. Just select star from users. <clears throat> the next line we're gonna write is what's gonna give it meaning. <clears throat> First, we're gonna write dollar sign statement. We're gonna write a variable to hold the value. We're gonna access our con variable, which currently holds our PDO connection. Dollar sign con. Con is an object and we're gonna call a method on it called prepare. And then the value we're gonna to give to prepare is the SQL value. Here's what this statement means. Access the connection to MySQL. Take this select statement and prepare it for me. This select statement is the only MySQL command you are allowed to execute. That's literally what we're saying. You are not allowed to execute any other SQL command after this point. Why is that a good thing? Because if we have a piece of data the user wants us to put into the database, and we've taken that from the user, and they write semicolon, drop database, <laughs> and we continue to parse, that will drop the database and we'll wind up exiting our whole database. What this does is it takes semicolon drop database, treats it as this literal string and goes, mm. <laughs> doesn't mean anything to it. So prepare, super important, helps protect our statement. The next piece we need to do, we need to tell it to execute which will literally take that statement and call it. Now we're executing the actual SQL statement. <clears throat> if you were to store the result of execute in a variable, it would either say true or false. That's literally it. So if it didn't work, it would return false. If it worked, it would return back true. It's not going to throw an error unless it's a SQL error. So if you have an incorrect select statement, then that will throw a SQL error on you. The last statement to actually get the users and put them so that we can work with them, we're gonna create a variable called users, and we're going to make it equal to dollar sign STMT fetch all. And what does fetch all do? Literally fetches all. It literally takes all of the users that you just called back and returns them all as a nice array. PHP will actually structure, it's more of a hash. Basically what it will look like, God, I love chalk. I'm one of the few like programming teachers that actually writes on chalkboards. What it will do is it will return back an array. So here's my array, right? And here's my first row. My first row, yay, right? And it will actually create this little hash with the name of the columns in the database and then their value. And it does the next one. Don't worry, I'm not going to write the whole thing out. In fact, I gave up right here. <laughs> Once it's done that, so say this is record one, 
comma, and then record two, and then record three, and then record four. So it's an array of nested hashes, essentially, nested arrays. So what we're going to do is take users, we're going to iterate through it, we're going to take a row, store it in a variable, and then look at that row, like parse that row, right? Super easy. So let's scroll down a little bit, because <clears throat> we have our users. So we're going to scroll down to, we're not going to do this check, we'll do this check in a minute. Right here where it says key body on line 50 or 50-ish. Iterate over the users and display their details. All right. Enter. PHP, nice inline command for each. And then I'm going to hit enter. Whoops. And for each. Those are the two statements we're going to need there. And that all of our code is going to go between those. What the for each does, the for each is a loop built into PHP that will iterate over an array. And it will take each item from the array and then store it in an alias variable. That variable, I, use, I like to call them throwaway variables because you use it for the, 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 the loop and then they're gone. They're done. You don't use it after that. So the first argument it needs is the array you want to iterate through, which is users. That's what we're iterating through. The next argument is to say basically as this alias. You, have you guys used as in your SQL statements yet? So you can actually do that. You can actually do select first name as name from users. And it aliases first name to name. You did do that? Yeah. So this is kind of like the same idea. This is saying iterate through users and take that first row. Make it as the value of user. So it literally stores it in the value of user. And then the super most important part of this statement, a colon, not a semicolon, a colon. Very needed. <clears throat> this is going to iterate the number of users that we have inside our database, which currently is 10. So we'll get 10 rows. I want them as individual rows. So I need a TR tag, right? So that I get rows. I'm going to create a row for each one of these users. And then I'm going to need three TD tags. So I'm going to have my first TD tag. And then I'm going to hold Alt, Shift, and press down twice to create two more. Next, I'm going to put my cursor in the top one, and I'm going to put out the user's full name. So a nice inline statement. And it'll be dollar sign user, not users. Very important you hear that. User, so this variable, not the users variable, okay? Because we want that array that's come back. We want this thing. We don't want this thing because that's useless to us. We want this hash, okay? So we can say user, and now I want to access this key because it's got my value in it, so I give it the key. Now, a common issue that Monday's class had is they kept forgetting this underscore, and they just wrote first name. Some wrote F name. Some wrote just name. They thought you could literally write whatever you want there, and it would work. That's not true. This needs to be the name of the column in the database because that's what happens when execute occurs, or sorry, when fetch all occurs, it takes all that information from the database, iterates it, and creates the keys from the names of the columns, and then inserts the values as the values of each of those keys. So you got to make sure that first name is the name that's inside your database column. Put your cursor after that one. We're going to create another one. And this will be dollar sign user, last name, obviously.
So we have first name and last name. Now I'm going to do you a favor just so you can see that a little easier. I'm just going to move this down to this piece because I'm just going to nest it nicely in there so that you can easily see it. Okay. In here, I'm going to put in the email, same thing, totally exactly the same thing, just dollar sign, user. Nope, sorry, we need to do an inline echo statement. Can't forget that part, dollar sign, user, email. Super easy. <clears throat> <clears throat> and then the last one, I'm going to put my keys in here. This is where I'm going to echo out the actual created at date. So I'm going to create a nice inline equal statement. And this is going to look like this. I'm going to call the date function from PHP. The date function will literally just give me back a formatted date. I'm going to tell it the format that I want to use. I want to use D slash M slash Y, which stands for, anybody want to guess? Exactly. Day, month, year, comma, sorry, not in, yeah, comma, the second argument. The second argument is the time. However, it wants the time in seconds. It doesn't want the time as a formatted date. However, in our database, our users are actually in formatted dates. Like we have a created at date that's a proper formatted date. So we need to convert it. So we're gonna use another function called S-T-R-T-O-T-I-M-E, which stands for string to time, brackets, because we need to put an argument in it. And in there, we're gonna put in the user created at. So that, again, date is a function that will format for us. The format we want is day, month, and year. String to time will take a date and return it back as seconds. So this becomes seconds, and then those seconds now get formatted into a proper date time. If I'm correct, it's literally the number of seconds from 1973 to right this minute is what gets returned. Why 1973? I have no idea. That just happens to be the date that they started from. I want to duplicate this because I like day, month, year, but I also want to see hour, minute, and seconds. Not hour, minute, and seconds. I want to see hour, minute, and meridian, which is AM, PM, right? And I want to put a break so they're on two separated lines. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take this guy, put my cursor next to it, hold Alt-Shift and press down, and that will duplicate the line. <clears throat> then I'm just going to put my cursor on the other one and create a blank line between them and put in a BR tag in there. So it creates a break. Now, the only thing I need to do is give it a new format, right? So this format that needs to go in here, it needs to be for hours, minutes, and the meridian. And you might be like, okay, so H colon M space, a, maybe, and you'd be wrong, <laughs> because M stands for month. So you might be like, well, then capital M. No, that's still month. It's just month with, like, the full written date out. Well, then what the heck is I, or what the heck is minutes? Well, it's I, because <laughs> I just gave it away. It's literally this, G, which stands for G. I don't want 24-hour time. I want 12-hour time. So it's G. I don't know why this stands for minutes, but it does. And A, because we have AM and PM, so I guess A was available. <laughs> so they went with A. So once you have that written, jump over to the browser, hit refresh. And look, we've got all our peeps. Hi, peeps. But we also have this comment down here that says no users, which makes no sense. We have users. We can see those users. But this thing says otherwise. So obviously, we want to embed some conditional logic 
which will basically eliminate that block. If there are users, we won't see that. If there are no users, we will see that. So let's go ahead and implement that. So remember that cold, cold code folding thing that we were talking about before? Come up here beside table and click the arrow so it folds up the table for us. Makes it nice and easy to work here. Step four, check to see if any users are existing. So we're going to write a conditional statement here on line 40. And it's going to look like this. If count, which is a function, dollar sign users is greater than zero. <laughs> what count does, count will take the value of whatever you give it. It will count the number of items in it at a shallow level. That's super important to understand that, that it's at a shallow level. So if you have a nested array, it will only count the top level, right? It's going to count through the number of items inside that array, and then it's going to return back that value. If you give it a string, it will count the number of characters in the string and return it back to you as the number of characters that are in the string. So obviously, if we want to see how many users there are, we just do count users, and that will tell me how many users were returned. But in the next step, I can say, if the count of users is greater than zero, meaning we have at least one, there's at least one user, then go ahead and show the table of users. Now we're going to take this guy up to this point. Else, right, or otherwise. So else, meaning we have no users, right, because this condition failed. We're going to show this alert, and then we're going to end our if. So once again, if the count of users is greater than zero, don't forget this colon, show the table. Otherwise, don't show, make sure you use this. Else, make sure you use the colon. Show our warning and our if. Okay? So let's test it out. Is anybody still typing? I just don't want to flick over yet. Okay, I'll give you a second to finish typing that out. Once you're done, we'll go over and I'll show you that the, the note is gone. And then I'll show you the table can be gone. Yeah. What that means is that you likely in your PHP my admin don't have a table called or a database called comp underscore 1006. The way to know that, are you using WAMP or XM? WAMP, all right. If you go to your browser, type in, nope, not there. Go to your browser. Sorry, I've got too many operating systems running at one point. Go to localhost slash php my admin and hit enter. It'll take you to this page. So localhost php my admin. Are you on this page? Do you have a big error? No dice? You're there? Cool. Your username is likely root. And then just click go because the password's probably empty. Are you in? On the left hand side, you should have a database called comp underscore 1006. No dice? You're going to click new. In this field here, you're going to type in comp underscore 1006. Not five, six. <laughs> Here, where it says the language, you're going to look for UTF-8. And you're looking for general. It's called general CI. So UTF-8 
underscore general underscore CI. It's way down towards the bottom of the list. You have to scroll quite a bit. Or if you type UTF-8 really, really fast, it'll jump. UTF-8 underscore general underscore CI. Did you get it? Cool. Then you're going to click create. I'm not going to click create because I already have it. Okay. Now you have your database. I want you to click on Comp 1006 on the left-hand side. Cool. I want you to click on import. I want you to go to choose file. Uh, choose file is right here. So import, choose file. Click on choose file. Then I want you to go to your C drive. WAMP64. Yeah, www comp-1006, lesson four, <laughs> don't worry, we're gonna get there. And then you see the comp underscore 1006 SQL file. It might not say .sql, but it'll say comp underscore 1006. Yeah, double click that. Okay, so now it should say that it's loaded here, right? Scroll down to go, click go and you should get a whole mess of these little green blocks. Good? Now, go back to your browser and hit refresh. And now you should have a list of users. Do you have a list of users? Okay, errors are not bad. Do any of them say the database is missing? Well, then we fixed that one, <laughs> so we're good, all right? All right, the rest of you, just before I help this gentleman, the rest of you, I want you to scroll and you'll notice the notification is gone because our if condition found users, right? Because we have users, there's no notification. If we wanna force the notification to happen, if you come up to where you're selecting your users here, and uh, I'm just gonna do Alt, Shift, and press down. And I'm just going to change this to an empty array. Nice empty array. Just leave this one in place. PHP will not blow up if you overwrite a value. It doesn't care. So there we go. There's my empty array. I'm even going to put a comment beside no users in my house. There we go. No users. Right? Now, if I jump over to the browser and hit control R, we should see our notification that says, no users, perhaps you should create a new one. I notice there's this wonderful link here that is going to allow us to create a new one, but if we click there, there's nothing there, right? That's next week, because we are definitely out of time. <laughs> so that will be next week that we'll actually create the form. This week, we've created the users index, to get rid of this, just put your cursor on it, hit control slash to comment it out. That'll bring our users back. So if you hit slash slash, now our users will be back. All right, let's go ahead and refresh. Cool, we have users. All right, next week, because we are very, very far behind, um, I've made some structural changes to the course. I'm gonna re-release the new syllabus. Uh, so the structural changes that I've done to the course are excluding the MVC portion. So the model view controller system that we were going to learn before, we are not going to have time. It takes too much work to do. And just based on how we're progressing, I feel like the concepts are overly complex. What I'm going to do instead is I've already taught that side of that course before. I'm going to include those lessons in a readily available spot for you so that if you want to like zoom ahead and learn model view controller system, you can, okay? However, instead we're gonna slow down. We're going to attempt to get create done this week, next, like sorry, next week so that we have the create done. We're gonna get authentication done in week six. There's no midterm, okay? Instead, I'm taking the actual midterm, we're gonna incorporate it into the final and the final will be worth 30%. 
okay? Just because we're not at a point where we can do a midterm where it's going to have any value. So it doesn't make sense. Um, however, we need to talk about this thing, the project. So the due date on this project is for October 26th. I'm obviously going to extend that because it's definitely not going to work out. I will probably make it for uh, November, probably mid-November is what we'll look for. What the project will incorporate, you can have up to four people in a group, just four. You can work on it on your own. I know some of you have jobs. You can't get into groups because you can't deal with that whole group dynamic issues. Um, so that's totally fine. But you can have up to four people in your group, okay? So the first part, super, super easy. All you're going to do is create a small write-up about the project that you're going to build and how you're going to incorporate the required pieces. So you're looking for an idea. Now, whenever I do this, I always wind up with like 15 freaking bookstores. I don't want a bookstore. <laughs> Please don't submit a bookstore. Bookstores are so easy. I want you to think outside the box a little bit. Try to come up with an idea that still meets the requirements, but that you can show off to a potential employer, right? Somebody that's going to hire you. I want you to really kind of flex a little. So try to think outside the box. As long as you meet the requirements, you'll make 100% in this project. No problem. I'm not one of those people that doesn't think people don't deserve 100%. Uh, in fact, I'm overly generous with bonus marks. So <laughs> if you step outside the box and you show me something that isn't a freaking bookstore or a bookstore-like thing, <laughs> then I will likely reward you with more marks. To give you an idea, I did have one student hand in a bookstore that was actually worth it. He connected to the, um, the ISBN network and pulled ISBN data down for a book and populated his database with ISBN data. You typed in the name of the book, it immediately went and grabbed the ISBN data and loaded the record for you. That was smart. That guy works at CareDove in Aurelia because I recommended him to work at CareDove in Aurelia. His name's Pretender. Friggin' smart. So smart, that kid. Things like that impressed me. I love stuff like that because it's not something he learned in the class. It's something that he had to go teach himself to do in order to incorporate it in his project. That, that shows that you're advancing, learning, using this stuff to help facilitate your learning. So first 10%, you're going to basically write a small presentation. You can either do it in Google Slides or you can do it as a Google Doc. That's totally fine. And then just share me the link. That's absolutely cool. Um, you're not presenting it, so don't take the word presentation as meaning you have to present it. It's not. It's just you're writing up a presentation of your project idea, okay? And you're pitching it, basically. Pitching might be a new word for you guys. Pitching basically means explaining your idea in a salesy kind of way, like you're selling your idea. That's what a pitch means. The next part, too, you're going to implement the user authentication. The very, very good news we're going to do that in class. We're going to build the whole user authentication. You're going to take the user authentication out of our portfolio, and you're going to dump it into your project. And then you're going to tweak it to make it work with your project. Okay? But we're building it in class. So don't freak out. Part three, this is the part. We are going to build this part. We're going to build um, a parent-child resource. We're going to learn how to create a resource in this class. We're already kind of doing that with users. Users are a resource, right? We're going to learn how to create a non-authenticated resource, right? Uh, how to create it, read it, update it, and delete it. Once you've done that twice, it becomes a lot easier to start scaling it out. And we're also going to do this parental relationship between a resource. Uh, the way we're going to do it for our thing is we're going to make it so that people can comment on different pieces that you put inside your uh, portfolio. So if you put a portfolio piece in, a user, a registered user, can comment on that portfolio piece. Because of that, that portfolio piece now has a parent-child relationship. The portfolio piece is the parent. The children would be all the comments, right? And that's how the association will work. Hopefully, by the time we hit that point, Andrew and Ben have already gone over foreign keys, and it won't be such a big issue to actually talk about that. Uh, if they haven't, I will do a crash course on foreign key relationships in MySQL because I know MySQL too. So it doesn't matter. 
Um, <clears throat> anyways, this whole thing, currently it says it's due October 27th. I'm going to change that date to mid-November. Uh, I'll actually give you an actual date, and we'll push it to that point. Any questions? No? Don't stress out. Not that big of a deal. It should be easy. It just depends on how much effort you want to put into it to really shine, right? Flex. Isn't that what the kids say? Flex. You want to flex, right? <laughs> Show off a little bit. Um, cool. Uh, that's it. That's all I've got for you today. If anybody needs help, I'll give you a hand. Let me just stop my recording so we don't lose.